Massachusetts Amherst. I'm currently a management major and I've been very fortunate over the past year to be given an opportunity to intern with Adams Community Bank in HR, lending, and as a teller. And I'll pass it on to Anissa. Hi everyone, my name is Anissa. Um, I'm currently a sophomore at Massachusetts College of um, well, MCLA. Um, I am double majoring in community and public health education as well as health sciences with the concentration in PA. And I also play on the women's soccer team and I'm a part of admissions ambassador. Thank you very much, Yvonne, Anissa, and Anne-Marie. Um, as we're starting to go through tonight's process, we have a series of slides that we're gonna show you that'll be projected on the screen. We'll also be able to share with you some information in the Q&A later on throughout the course of the evening as well. But as we're going through and we're having discussions and something pops in your head that you'd like to know a little bit more about, please add in the Q&A and we will be able to address it at the end of our program tonight. We'll have a, about 10, 15 minutes left in our evening to be able to talk about your particular questions that you have. And then we also will be able to share information about how you can get additional questions answered as you're going through this time. But as, as you're thinking about the college process and as you're trying to navigate this piece, the one message that we want to leave you tonight, if you take nothing else from tonight's presentation, the one message we want to leave you tonight is for students, tell people. Tell people what you're thinking about. Tell people that you want to go on the college, that you're thinking about a two-year program, a four-year program, that you're thinking about becoming an engineering major, a bio major, because the more people you share, the more doors and the more opportunities are going to begin to open for you. People are going to want you to be successful going through the college search process. And if they don't know what you're thinking about, they're not going to be able to assist. So you will be amazed at the possibilities once you just start sharing with people what you're thinking about and your goals for your future. The other piece as we're going through tonight's program is we're gonna take a step back from time to time and think about it from the college admissions side. This is a big business opportunity from the college side. We want the best possible students like Anissa and Yvonne in our seats in our colleges. And in order for us to do that, we need to put out the best websites, the coolest videos and new publications. You're not gonna find any snow or frowns in the view books. And it's all designed to capture your attention. But it's your job as smart consumers to be able to understand what is the best fit for you and for your family as you're going through this college process. We did a little um, experiment a couple of years ago where we had one of our work -say students pretend they were in your seats, pretend that they were a high school junior. And they just went on to some websites, they signed up for the SAT, and it's amazing the amount of material that they gained. And just over the course of three months, three months. This is all the material that was starting to happen. I know it's a little hard to see on the video, but it's a stack of information. And tonight, our goal is to share with you how you're going to make sense of all this material, how you're going to navigate this material, and be able to find that best fit for you and your family. So without further ado, let's get into the heart of our program. And uh, as we go through, please keep in mind, if you have questions, please add them in the Q&A, and we will make sure they address them at the end. Anne-Marie. Okay, Josh. Um, are you able to show the PowerPoint? I will. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to just jump in. So I'm going to start with the part that is simply saying getting started. And from where you're sitting right now, uh, we all start with different backgrounds. Some of you, this is the first that you have thought about the college search process. Some of you, it's your second child, or maybe you went through yourself. But every year, the college uh, admissions process or industry is changing. So it's really important, no matter what your background is, that we know where we're starting. And the really the big question is there's about 4,000 colleges out there to start from. And we have to figure out how do we research colleges? How do we understand the process? How do we keep current? And many things we're gonna share with you tonight are just tiny bits of information. And then from there, you're gonna be working with your own school counselors in your own schools. Anything that I talk about tonight as a school counselor, please understand I'm talking in general. Um, I am not an expert in any way, um, but 
with the years of experience that I've had, hopefully I'll be able to share some of this information with you. So with this first screen here, there's about eight things that I want to be helping you to be thinking about when you start uh, with the process of just saying getting started. So the first one is the SAT and ACT. That's probably the biggest question right now coming into my office. Should I still take the SATs? when most colleges over this last year due to the pandemic went test optional, um, or there's a lot of different other words for that, but I won't get into that right now. And what I'm advising my students right now and school counselors across Berkshire County and Vermont and other places is that you should, if it is available locally to you, you should take your SATs at least twice, just in case the school you're applying to is still using it as part of the admissions process. Campus visits, get out there. The doors are starting to open. Josh is gonna get into that a little bit in more detail later, but if it's virtual or on campus, it's the only way you're gonna to begin to know what type of campuses you might be interested in. Ask yourself about affordability. What do you think your family um, can afford? And the big one is fit to major. Most of my students right now are saying they don't know what they want to study, but they have to have some kind of ideas. And you're going to be looking at schools that have multiple majors that are maybe related to each other. Demonstrated interest. This is where you're going to show the extent to which you show a particular college how interested you are in them, either by contacting admissions counselors, by visiting, by going to open houses. They keep track of all that information. Um, so you want to show your interest in a particular school. The old famous college list. We're going to teach you tonight how to start that. Summer plans. What are you doing this summer? Are you getting a job that's related to your major? It's really hard to do that right now. I understand that with internships and things, but how are you spending your summer? And then putting your resume together, and I will go through that later. But these are just some topics that should be places of where you're starting um, when you start to put together your preliminary list and even just start thinking about planning for college. Okay, Josh, the next slide. Great. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Emory. Um, we're going to kind of go through this slide very briefly, but I want to make sure that Yvonne and Anissa have a chance to kind of share with you their experiences as well as how they got started. So one of the tips that we strongly suggest is if you have not met your guidance counselor, tomorrow morning, first thing, either sign up online or if you're in school, stop and see them. They are gonna be your greatest resource and your greatest support. Across our region, we have amazing, amazing guidance counselors who really wear their hearts on their sleeve to make sure that you are successful through this college process. They know the admissions counselors that are coming in and out of the schools. They know where school alumni have gone and have been successful. And they can easily pick up the phone and have great relationships with admissions counselors to be able to advocate or ask your questions that you may have. If we start to think about this from the big business perspective, keep in mind, like I said, the colleges want to be able to bring in the best possible students out there. And we have admissions staff that go out and travel to the high schools, to the college fairs when we could, or to the virtual fairs right now and doing virtual appointments. And we want the best possible students. So a small school, for example, like MCLA, in order for us to reach our goal of 400 students each year in our first year, student class, our freshman class, we know we need to have at least 2,500 or so applicants. And then we whittle that down. And we have five admissions counselors that are out traveling. Now we can't ask an admissions counselor to go out and get 2,000 applications, but we can ask an admissions counselor to find their top leads, to find the best possible 40 students out there that have really impressed them throughout this college process. And so that's how we're going to talk about this evening is those particular steps. So number one, working with your guidance counselors. Number two, keeping yourself organized and creating a simple folder or an electronic folder for yourself and putting all that information that you're really proud of. A great English paper, something was written about you in the school newspaper, a piece of artwork that you're really proud of because that folder is going to come in handy two times. Number one, when you are going to write your college essay, your college essay is a story about you. When you can pull that folder open and you have this great piece of artwork or something was written about you in the newspaper, you have all that material right there to begin building your story. The second time is when you're sitting down for an interview and your number one school choice and you show that admissions counselor your file and you say, this is why I should be accepted. This is all the great material that I did in high school. Now I'm going to continue that in my college experience as well.
So really thinking about how you're getting yourself organized and how you're collecting the materials to tell your story. Challenging yourself academically. Now is the time where you're gonna to start to plan for your fall semester. Colleges reward you for challenging yourself above and beyond. So if you have an opportunity to take an honors class or an AP class, or even an MCLA or Berkshire Community College or, or Vermont Community College dual enrollment class, please choose to do that. Talk with your guidance counselor, talk with your teachers first to make sure it's appropriate. But what happens is those grades get reweighed and they get reweighed at a higher level. You're not gonna see that on your side, but on the college admission side, what happens is a, a honors class, for example, gets half a point higher. An AP class gets a full point higher. So, and regardless of what you receive on the AP exams. So let's say, for example, you took college prep bio and you received a B in it. Well, if you took it on an honors level, the colleges see that as a B plus. If you take it at an AP level, the colleges bring that up to an A for you. And it's called reweighing your grades and rewarding, your, rewarding you for being uh, challenging your academic self. If you take a dual enrollment class, you not only receive the credit for that course on a college transcript, but you also receive that additional point higher too on your high school transcript from most schools. People listing right now for recommendations. So as you're a junior, now is the perfect time to ask those instructors, to ask those coaches, to ask your supervisor to start thinking about a letter of reference. Because think about it, in the fall, everyone in your senior class is gonna to start to ask for letters of recommendation from the same teachers. Well, if we think about it from the college side, admissions counselors recruit in territories and in regions. So the admissions counselor for a high school here in Berkshire County might be the, read the same applications from everybody else in that same high school. So it's very easy to lay out the transcript from one high school and be able to see those teachers who give everybody A's, right? That's not the person you want for a recommendation. We colleges wanna see that recommendation letter from the teacher who um, you did extra assignments for, you stayed after school, you worked as hard as you could, and maybe a B, maybe a B minus, a C plus was the best grade you could get, but you were really, really successful with that piece. And that shows how you are resilient, which is a trait that is gonna be very, very in sought after as you're going into your college experience. Coaches, people who know you outside the school, volunteers, if you babysit for a family, not just anyone trusts their children with someone, asking that family for a reference as well is very, very helpful. So Yvonne and Anissa, Yvonne, do you mind starting, just kind of sharing a little bit about how you began your college process? Sure, um, I began my college process very early into high school. I was extremely involved in the APs and dual enrollment. So my senior year, I was taking classes at MCLA, thanks to Josh for helping me get into that. And that really showed me how I liked my classes. And personally, I did very well at MCLA, but to get started on that, that was a really great builder for what I was looking for with college and what I was thriving at. So just those classes were what really helped me determine my focus and my desired major. So when I was putting together my list and my folder, I knew that I wanted to focus on business. So to target people in my high school for recommendations that I had done more of a business side with like working in clubs and executive positions and things like that, that was gonna be the best vantage point for me to set myself aside because that shows early on your passion and drive in your interests and college is will recognize that from a younger point you were diligent in working towards your desired goal and major to improve yourself as whatever profession you were looking to go into. Excellent point Yvonne, thank you very much for sharing that. Anissa, what are your thoughts? How did you begin your college search? So I 100% agree with, with Yvonne is saying, um, I can definitely say that during high school, I should have started earlier than I did, which is something that I recommend for all high schoolers right now. Um, time definitely flies by. And so you're thinking as a freshman that, oh, you have several years, you know, until college comes. But in reality, those four years are going to fly by. So it's important for you to get on top of those APs. Um, I know I took five APs when I was in high school, 
So taking dual enrollment classes as well is an advantage. And um, I would just say, start looking into schools right now. Like you might think it's early, but it's not early. When you have that list and you keep modifying it, you keep saying, oh, these are my reaches and these are my safety schools and you start compacting it, it'll really help you a lot. I know that I wanted to go to several schools but those schools might not be the one for you. And it's important to talk to people. It's important to talk to other people who you know that may be going there and to really look into the schools. I can definitely say that for myself. I didn't really look into the schools. I just wanted to go there, wanted to go to some of the schools because of the names, because they were big leagues, big universities. I wanted to go to Harvard, you know? But um, it's important for you to look into those schools, to talk, to build relationships with those teachers, um, so that you can get recommendations that, you know, they won't be saying the same thing about you compared to someone else. Um, so like Yvonne said, um, I agree with her. She started early. I feel like everyone should start early, even if you think it's too early. It's not. And yeah. Thank you very much, Anissa. Excellent points as well. Um, <clears throat> before you begin to make any contact with schools too, we strongly recommend that you Google yourself first. What is it that pops up about your particular name? Because guess what? Colleges are gonna do it. Scholarship committees are gonna do it. If you're in my seat and you're deciding between uh, for your last seat in your class, that 399th seat in the class, and I'm trying to decide who I should in very similar grades, very similar scores, very similar experiences in high school, what I'm gonna do, and it's legal and everyone does it, is we're gonna Google your name and we're gonna see what pops up. And usually it's that Twitter feed, that Instagram feed. And if you would not friend your grandmother, or you would not share your feed with your grandmother, um, that's something that you should really take a look at and, and understand it a little bit better and clean it up if you possibly can, because you want to put your best foot forward as you're moving with opportunities for these schools. This is the opportunity for your future. You do not want something silly holding you back. Also, hoochiemama at yahoo.com, chugabeer at gmail are not appropriate email addresses for your college application, students and parents. Um, we wanna make sure, again, we have to protect our communities, the college communities. So we do not wanna have any particular reason to say no thank you to a student. We wanna make sure that the students who are applying are ready to go successful day one as soon as they hit the campus. So please make sure that you do check your social media accounts before you begin to move forward. Emory, I'm gonna pass it back to you for our next slide. Okay. Right. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> it's being suspenseful. <laughs> so yeah. what, why Josh is working on that. Um, we are now gonna go into the phase of how to create a college list. And that obviously is the biggest piece of the Cole College admissions process. And what I wanna to say to the students and the families is that first you have to think about um, a lot of questions for yourself first. There's a lot of personal questioning. Um, I need you to understand that this process is fluid. You have to do a lot of reflection, a lot of research. Things that you want in spring of your junior year is gonna change fall of your senior year and shocking by the spring of your uh, senior year. So I need you to know that that's kind of how this process goes. And you need to start asking yourself, what do you want? What do I need? And what do I like? And you might not be able to answer all of those right now, but you have to look within right now. And there's a lot of things when you start looking, obviously major, everyone's asking you about your major, but that's one of the things you're gonna look at at the schools that you are searching, the cost, what is the starting direct cost of these schools? The location, where is it? Is it in Buffalo where there's a lot of snow or are you going down to Miami? How far from home are you going? The cost rises when you go farther from home. So now you need a plane ticket to get there. So there's a lot of factors with distance. What about the climate, the students on campus, the feeling you have when you get there? Um, if you have a special talent, you have to market it. Now is your time. So if you are an excellent, you know, award-winning oboe player, you got to tell people that because there's certain schools that are looking for that. Are you going in the country? You're going skiing up in Vermont. 
Um, are you going into Boston to the city? So there's a lot of different factors, including size. Size is a big one. So it's not just number of students on the campus, but what's the size of the classes on campus? So these are all things that you're gonna start asking yourself. And there's a lot of tools that you're gonna be using um, that ask you these questions to be able to start getting this preliminary college list together. But I need you to know that everybody's different. Everybody has a different set of priorities, a different set of likes and wants. And some things on this list are deal breakers and others are negotiable. So that's what you need to keep asking yourself. So if right now you wanna go as far as way as possible, a lot of my juniors do, but then as the year starts to go on into the senior year, you know, uh, a six plus hour college away from home might not seem as important. That might be negotiable to you when you start seeing costs. So you have to start thinking about what is a must and what is one thing that you can maybe change and still be happy? Want to go on to the next one, Josh? Going on to the next one. <laughs> so as we're going, and there are four um, domains basically that I want to make sure that you are thinking about and having honest discussions with your family. Obviously financial, that is such a big piece for all of us attending college. I would love to say that maybe you're one of those that have you know, an aunt that left you all of this money and you don't have to apply for financial aid, but that's not most of us. So the financial aid process can be scary for many of us, but what's scarier is not sitting down right now as a family to discuss if there is any financial support coming from the family. Are you a family that been able to save some money or not. Uh, I've had some families that haven't had that discussion until their son or daughter have been accepted to college. It's about March or May, excuse me, March or April of their senior year. And they're telling their child for the first time they cannot afford these schools. So those honest conversations need to start right now. And they can also start with the school counselor, local financial aid officers. So if you're saying, you know, Amory, I don't know what kind of conversation to have with my child call your school counselor. They are happy to start those conversations for you. Academics, what's the best fit for you? If you're going in with a specific major, does that school have other related majors? Because I can guarantee you, majority of us are changing our major within that first year. If you're going in as an unknown or undeclared major, what type of first year program does that school have to help you explore possible majors at that school? And then the last two kind of go together, the social and environment. I can tell you once you get on a campus and you walk around and there's students there and you look at bulletin boards and you ask, you know, what happened here last weekend for fun. Um, those are the things you want to see if you fit on that campus. So it's about affordability, about academic su success and having the major and also the fit where you can walk off that campus and say, you know, and then maybe not a fancy word, but I can see myself there because all of these pieces come together for you to have your academic success. So these are four areas that I wanna make sure that as you're starting to develop your list that you're thinking about when you start your research. So Anissa and Yvonne, this is a lot of outstanding information that Amory is sharing with us. Do you mind unpacking a little, a little bit for, your experiences, how did you identify these four areas in your own college process? Anissa, would you like to start? Yeah, so um, like Anne-Marie mentioned, it's different for everyone. So for me, the financial aspect was I was looking for a school that wasn't that expensive, especially because this is for my bachelor's degree. I know that I wanna go to med school, so I can't really go to a a school that's very expensive when I'm going to be going through a lot of schooling, which I'm going to have to pay for. Um, you have to, I took out a loan to go to MCLA. So you have to think about that. If your parents cannot pay the full amount, the amount you're going to have to be borrowing and then in the future paying back. Um, I chose MCLA for a numerous amount of reasons. I live in Boston. Um, there's a bunch of universities in Boston, but I wanted to explore. I wanted to get out of Boston, go to an area where I was unfamiliar with and um, I found MCLA. Well, I always say that MCLA found me because I did not even know of MCLA. Oscar, one of the one of the counselors there at MCLA actually came to my high school and talked of it so briefly, um, telling me how I could play soccer there, how it's a small liberal arts school. And I could definitely say that 
my senior year, I did not know what I wanted to do in college. I did, I was undeclared, undecided. Um, that's when I went to MCLA and Ceci, you know, puts together um, a numerous amount of classes your first year to just test out everything you want. And then now I'm a double major with a concentration. So I can definitely say that with the financial aspect, look for what's man manageable for you. Have those conversations with your parents. What can they what can they help you with? What can't they help you with? Um, apply for as much um, scholarships as you can. Like I know my teachers used to tell me everyone doesn't apply for scholarships because they believe that everyone is going to apply. So that's why I feel like everyone should apply for scholarships and look into that environment and that social aspect. Um, I wanted a small liberal arts school. My high school was humongous. The teachers didn't really know you, whereas a small liberal arts school, the teachers are invested in you. They talk to you. They know your name. They know when you're missing from class. And that social aspect, you know a lot of people at the school. Like I said before, I play soccer. So I had friends before I even went to MCLA. And then when I went to MCLA, I just regained more and more friends and made more relationships with people. So, yeah. Excellent. Great information. Thank you so much for sharing, Anissa. And Yvonne, do you have um, some thoughts, ideas on how those four key elements work for your success? Absolutely. So for me, I was very major driven. I always knew what I wanted to do. So when it came down to it, I wanted to get the most accredited business education I could without paying the heavy dime for it. So instead of looking at schools like Bentley or Tufts where uh, I would get a very, very credible degree, but it would cost me an arm and a leg. I was looking at other schools which did have good, strong business programs. Great alumni connections was one of my deal breakers. I needed an, a strong alumni base to feel that there was going to be ample opportunity. And then I found UMass and it fit a great financial pinpoint and it fit a great academic pinpoint with all of the high ratings and the resources. Look into the resources alone that an academic program can offer you. So while I might not have what Anissa has with the small teachers who know you, I sit in lectures of 470 students. They do not know my name. They don't call on me. Most of it is TAs. And that's not perfect for everyone, but I enjoy that because I don't enjoy people being into my business as much. I like to walk around campus unknown and see a familiar face here and there, but not recognize everyone. So everyone is gonna have different preferences, but I think what it ultimately comes down to is you need to make sure that you're at a school that is gonna have the right resources for you. So I need alumni resources and connections. Anissa needs in-depth professors because her major needs people who are getting in-depth with their students. Whereas my major is something where it's a lot of professional development. And so I need those connections. So I think the distinction there when it comes to an academic and the environment of the colleges you're looking at is to make sure that when it comes down to it, regardless of the size, other things like that, just looking at how their classes are gonna be shaped and how those will help you advance your career is the main point. Wow, excellent, excellent. Excellent work for, for both, of, both of you to share so in depth your personal thoughts, experiences, feelings, and in ways that our, our students in the audience tonight can really think differently about their college search process and what's gonna be most important as Anne is saying, in the fit pyramid. What are the needs, what are the wants, what are the likes, and what takes precedent over one another in your own personal um, academic, academic and, and college going experience. Emory, here's a list of some outstanding reliable resources that you've been sharing with students. Would you like to just kind of talk briefly about them? Sure, just real quick. And I just wanna add a point to any students that are listening right now. Our two college students that just presented they didn't know all those things when they first started. Okay, so it takes time. So I need everyone to breathe right now because that was excellent. But I can tell you if you're a junior right now, you don't know anything yet of what you want. But how you figure it out is by doing this process. Okay, so everything we're telling you tonight, 
You as the student need to be the one that's driving this and learning about yourself. So going to this slide now, um, I just want to make a quick point about this. I want to make sure all the families are using reliable resources. Every day, you can Google a new name of something and they pretend to be a reliable resource. If you are going down a road of using a, um, a website particularly a lot, please contact your school counselor and say, is this a reliable resource? Can I count on the data that's in here, the information's in here? Um, so for example, the Fisk Guide to College is an, is an actual book. So if you're people out there that still like to turn a page, um, there are books that you can still use. Mainly most of us are using websites. The most used one is the College Board website. Not only do your SATs on there, your essay prep on there, but you can do college search scholarships. But the other names on here, I just put on here, but we did send, I believe, a list of websites for college search, for financial aid, for career search. So to all of the members of this tonight, please use those because we are noting that those are reliable resources for your family to use. And Vaughn, you mentioned that you use some other resources in addition to these pieces. Would you mind sharing? Yep, so I added those onto the resource list that Taylor had sent out earlier to all the attendees. I looked a lot at resources like the Princeton Review and a site called Niche, which are both um, student-based ratings. So that gives you an accurate idea about how students on campus feel about the programs there, the dining there, the social life, um, the professors and how the classes are set up. So depending on what you're curious about, you could do a general search on those sites for top 10 kinesiology schools in the US. And then it'll give you a ranked list and bullet points down through that. Excellent, thank you very much, Yvonne. Now we are about halfway into our program tonight. If again, I know some questions coming through the Q&A, if you have anything that pops up that you'd like us to answer, we are going to save time and address your questions towards the end of the program. Or we'll also try to kind of embed it in some of our work that we're talking about for the next few slides. We're gonna address the admissions timeline. We're gonna talk about college fair experience and then those personal visit opportunities will be our next um, half an hour of discussion. So if we're moving forward, just as a quick recap, understanding your needs, your personal needs. What are those that are most important for you that create the foundation of your understanding throughout the FIT pyramid? So what are those needs? What are those wants? And what are those likes? And you see the pyramid on your screen there. So please keep that in mind because it really helps as you're beginning to make those decisions as an individual student, as a family, and then also as you're gonna to begin to transition to college to be that much more successful because you wouldn't wanna choose a school that is alike, but it doesn't have your needs. Your needs are your foundation. Exactly what is it there that's gonna allow you to be academically successful moving forward? Amory, do you mind just briefly stepping us through the next um, slides in regards to timeline for specifically juniors? Um, as they're going through the spring, summer, and into the fall? Sure. So my first point of advice is to just look at the next couple months, okay? Like maybe through summer. Because if you pick your head up and look at the whole process, it could feel very paralyzing and overwhelming. So I just want to make sure that you understand right now, perhaps some of the things you should be doing between now and June and then over the summer. And we're lucky enough to have Adams Community Bank offering this as a, a college readiness series. So if we're lucky enough, uh, Josh and I will be back in the fall and we're gonna continue the timeline um, through the fall and in spring of your senior year. So right now, first thing Josh already told you guys, you should be making an appointment with your school counselor and understanding the role of the counselor and what are some um, programs your particular high school already has established, okay? So that's something that we're rolling out with our juniors. We talked about you taking the SAT and starting your preliminary college list. Your resume, just real quick on that. I want you to understand what a student resume is. It's different than if you're applying for, like your parent that's applying for a new job. Your student resume, what are your highlights? What are your activities, your awards and honors, your academic highlights since ninth grade? That's in your school and in your community. This is your time to shine. This is your time to show the things that you have done. Um, so you wanna continue to 
add to that as maybe you're you're winning book awards as a junior right now or other um, awards in your school. Keep an active resume because you're going to use that with your college admissions application and your scholarship applications. Your two letter of recommendations, Josh already went over that. I just want to add one more, and that is um, what we call an other, you know, kind of like a coach or an employer or a clergy person. It's really helpful to have that other person because sometimes, especially through the, the scholarship process, they ask for that. But one thing I want to ask, have you ask your school counselor is, what is their process and you approaching a teacher at your school on how to ask for a letter of recommendation? So for example, in our school, there's an actual document that our students have to, to fill out. And we teach our juniors things like, you don't go up to your teacher in the middle of class and ask them, okay? You wanna make sure that you appropriately do it when they're not teaching. Explain to them, if you don't have a form to fill out, where you're applying, maybe what your major is, um, and what you're asking of them, but also give them a timeline of when you might need that letter back and how are they giving it to you? Are they giving it to the school counselor or are they giving it directly to you? Because some teachers will keep it confidential. Having the honest talk with your parents, it's not just about the finances, but what are your wishes? What are you looking for in distance and major? Because if your family, your parent or guardian is thinking one thing, maybe they're thinking you're gonna stay local, you're gonna to go to Berkshire Community College or MCLA, and you're thinking California, okay? If you don't have those honest conversations now, you're gonna waste a lot of time. So it's important and they're hard conversations. But if you again need a third person in there, your school counselor is very happy to have those conversations with you. Between now and June, any campuses that are open or virtual is to get out there and start understanding size and feeling and things like that. And that's how you're gonna be able to get a chance to figure out what you should be looking for. And then obviously the, the virtual college fairs. So that's things between now and June. Now, what about summer? Sorry, but you don't get the summer off, okay? This process just keeps going. So you're gonna be finalizing your college list, beginning to fill out something that's called the common application. That is a universal, application that many high or excuse me many colleges belong to one place to answer all of the basic demographic information one essay maybe some supplementals but then you get to submit that information to multiple different colleges your uh, teacher letter of recommendations are uploaded your guidance counselor uploads the transcript you need to begin you need to get an account by june but also be filling out most of your, your common application over the summer, in addition to other applications. Beginning your essay, brainstorming, thinking about it, getting a first draft, maybe getting a job or internship that might be related to your major, but also with the pandemic, we know how hard that is. But even if it's a day in the fall even that you get to shadow somebody and get an idea, keep editing your resume, and also just in general, start putting a spreadsheet together that you understand each college, what are they asking for? Do they use the common app? Do they use their own application? What's the deadline? Are there other forms that are needed? Put everything in one place because I can promise you it gets very confusing. And if you miss a college deadline, you, can con you can't come down to your school counselor and say, I'm so sorry, I had a late soccer game last night and I missed my deadline to, Westfield State. Nobody can do anything about deadlines, okay? So SAT deadlines, college deadlines, you as the student need to make sure you understand. And if you have a difficult time keeping things organized, that's when your parent or guardian, I'm sure is happy to help you do that one piece. Excellent. So the next step, we're just gonna talk briefly about the college fair opportunities. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Anissa and Yvonne again to kind of share a little bit about if they had college fair experiences, what it was like for them, how they navigated those pieces, or if they chose not to do the college fair and what, uh, what other strategies they used. So when we're thinking about the college fair, um, right now, as you know, the college fairs are virtual. So there are two outstanding opportunities that are still coming up, and it's go to collegefairs.com. This is where you traditionally would go to the large college fairs at the Big E or at Hartford Convention Center. These are held virtually online, the 14th of April and the 16th of May. These are outstanding opportunities because for both of these, they're expected to be close to 300 to 400 colleges there. Okay, so it's gonna be a virtual environment and you choose which ones you wanna to go to. 
So how do you prep for something like that? How do you prep for a, an overwhelming type of experience where you go on and there's so many different options and opportunities? Well, that's where you come back to your pile. Your poor male person hunchback trying to get all this information to your house right now. And so you've now, as you've gone through your fit pyramid, as you started to really identify your needs and your wants and your likes, you've created four, three piles. Your yes pile, these schools have the size, the major, the programs, all my needs and wants are in one pile. You have your maybe pile. It might be a little bit too far away, but it has everything else I'm looking for, or it might be a larger school and I'm looking for a smaller school, but it has all the other elements. And then you have your no pile, your pile that you're just not interested in. Put those off to the side and recycle them. Get them out of your house so they don't cause any confusion or chaos to you. And when you're looking at the college fair, you're focusing on your yes pile. Let's really start to work on those first. So you have your top five schools that you're interested in right now. And in your college fairs, you wanna number one, have that discussion with your family first. What is the family looking for? What are my parents, my guardians looking for in my experience to college? What am I looking for? And having questions written down on both sides so that when you do go on the virtual environment and you do have the opportunity to talk with an admissions counselor, Keep in mind, we step back. Remember, the admissions counselors have their top 40 top or their top 40 leads that they need to gain. Well, one way to become a top lead is by having prepared questions ready to go. As Amory was saying, you did a little bit of research on the web. You started to identify some of those areas that have strong interest for you, as as Yvonne was talking about. And you have those questions in front of you, and you're knowledgeably talking about and learning about that particular school. You want to create your plan of attack so you know, all right, the, the fair is maybe open for only two hours. You have five schools you want to make sure you get to. You can see the list of schools that will be there, and you get to those five schools first. And then you can kind of shop around and see what all those maybe options are or other schools available. But the critical time is to be able to spend those couple minutes with the admissions counselor to identify yourself and separate yourself from the crowd, everybody else who's gonna be at that college fair experience so they get to know who you are because they're gonna go back and they're gonna write notes about you. If they've been impressed, they're gonna take down information. They're gonna share more and more about the college with you. And that's how you begin to get separated out. You also want to think about follow-up. So if you have a really outstanding discussion with one of your top five schools and you were able to gain the uh, time to talk to that admissions counselor, later on in the evening, sending a nice email. Hey, Josh, it was really nice to meet you. Thank you for taking the time during the virtual college fair today to talk with me about your biology program. Very simple, but very few students actually take the time to say thank you. And it separates you from everybody else that I may have met during that day. I'm gonna keep that information and I'm gonna keep an eye out if you come to visit. I'm gonna pay attention if you apply. If I have scholarship money ready to go, guess what? You'll be a prime candidate for it. So you've kind of become a top lead by separating yourself a little bit differently than everybody else who's gonna go through that college process. So. Anissa, Ivan, Anissa, we'll start with you. Would you mind sharing a little bit about college fair experiences you've had and or how you came about kind of identifying the schools that you're most interested in? Yeah, so um, in high school, we definitely did have a college fair. Um, I would say it's so important for you to come up with questions that you wanna ask each college that you wanna go to. So um, I came up with questions like, how big are the class sizes? Um, and what are the majors, and is my major one of them, um, or other que questions you may have about um, the environment, what clubs they may have. Um, I can definitely say that after speaking to some of the colleges that I went to at the college fair, they would give me a little slip and say, oh, write your name and write your email. We'll be sending you some more stuff. Um, so that's also important for you to do. I can definitely say that the college fair did help me in some ways of answering my questions. Like I said before, like having those questions to be answered, but also um, just giving me their input on what they think about the college. Of course, every college that's there is gonna try to convince you that you know their college is the best and it's for you, but you have to you know think about, is that college really for you? So you have to come up with those questions that, um, that you know are about yourself are about what your needs um i know 
that during the college fair, I was with my friends and, you know, they wanted to go to UMass Amherst or UMass Lowell. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go to, you know, the other schools because, of course, I love UMass Amherst, but in UMass Lowell, I love all the UMasses. But again, I wanted something different. So I wanted to go to the other colleges that, you know, not everybody was so much going to. Yeah. So thank you. Yvonne? Yeah, I definitely attended my fair share of career um, college fairs, I mean, but personally, of the schools on my list weren't at these college fairs, which was super unfortunate. But when going around to other schools that I didn't know any information on, the top question to ask right off the bat, just introduce yourself, say, hi, my name is, it's so nice to meet you. And then continue to go on, I'm interested in this field and ask if they have majors related to your field of interest. Because you don't want to spend 20 minutes talking to a recruiter about a college that doesn't offer anything close to what you're interested in. And you don't want to, by accident, get yourself attached to a school and invested in a school that academically isn't going to fit your needs. So always start off with asking questions about your needs, because I know it happened to me. There was one school I asked about it. Um, I was in love with the idea of it, how the campus was, the sizing was, the price, the culture. But the one thing it was missing was a major that correlated to my interests and how to get myself ahead. So Keep it clear your intentions with these admissions counselors, build these good relationships with them. But ultimately, if they don't have your major or your needs, just be upfront and get that question off the bat so you know whether to pursue this college or not. The second point I have is the admission counselors are going to be your best friends in this entire process. I had phenomenal relationships with my admissions counselors. I would call to ask questions. I talked to them when they came to the high school. One-on-one, -on -one, I got a lot of conversations with them because other students weren't as invested in speaking with these counselors. And that really sets you apart. And when you have a relationship with your admissions counselor, they can do a lot more for you. If you're struggling financially, you can reach out to them and say, do you know of any scholarships? Is there any way that I can look into getting more aid. I'm so invested in this school. I really want to go here. But right now, like, I just need a little bit of help to see if there's any maneuvering. And these admissions counselors and their relationships can help you far into the future. I am in contact with an old admissions counselor from four years ago um, about career opportunities and things like that. So these relationships are going to be super withstanding if you put the effort in initially and make sure that you can differentiate yourself from the rest of the crowd. Excellent. Yvonne, I'm going to come right back to you on this question too, is uh, you navigated the college fairs by yourself, right? And, and how did that become successful for you when an admissions counselor had a chance to see that yes, it was a very, very important for your family to be part of this process, but you stepped in front and you put yourself forward a little bit outside of your comfort zone to make that initial connection. Yeah, that definitely um, was really good to have that relationship because some admissions counselors might feel like the parent is pushing their child towards a school for some reason and they want to know that it's your interests there and that'll help them put the effort in more if it comes from you they're gonna have more desire and more incentive to keep working with you and to provide you the best experience and image of the college um, my parents weren't as involved in my process I wish they were because it would have been a lot easier to choose my school I ended up committing like a week before the deadline um, it would have been far earlier if I had gotten them involved sooner. So talk to your parents. But just that one relationship and one particular counselor, she really set the bar so astronomically high that while this school didn't meet um, all of my needs like UMass did, I just could not let go of the school because of my phenomenal experience with her and how willing she was to work with me. And she even went as far as to bring my parents into it to make sure that we were working together. So it's those admissions counselors that when you set themselves apart 
they're going to try to do everything in their power to get you to a place where you feel comfortable with your decision. And ultimately they're going to support your choices and want the best for you and to help you. So they're going to do everything they can when it's you speaking to them to make sure you know what you need to, because they'll assume that your parents have more information than you do. Excellent. Thank you so much, Yvonne. It is extremely important for your families to be part of this process. But if you think about it at the end of the day, students, if you step outside your comfort zone just a little bit, introduce yourself to those admissions counselors, send your personal thank you notes, make your own phone calls to the admissions office. Most of that information gets noticed and gets tracked that you're not afraid to step outside your comfort zone and be able to put yourself out there because the acceptance letter is going to have your name on it. You're going to be the one who's going to be living in the residence halls. You're going to be the one who's eating the food. You're going to be the one that's getting the A's in the classes. So you want to make sure that on my side, I'm going to be paying attention because I want you in, in my college. Uh, certainly, I want your family as well and their experiences. But at the end of the day, it's my job to get my top 40 students, and you potentially could be one of them. If we think about the next step, and our, this is going to be our last topic for this evening before we go to your Q&A, um, is the visit. How do we arrange those college visits? You've now gone and explored your top five schools. You've gathered more information. You go back and you do your research again. What is going on in the news? What is going on in those resources, those guides that Yvonne and Marie and Anissa have talked about? Um, you've talked to alums that have gone to the schools that you're most interested in. Maybe your guidance counselor has helped made extra connections for you with admissions counselors and now you have your top five schools yes we are going into this summer hopefully and we're starting to see many schools are doing small group um, sessions where you can come visit campus um, you may have individualized tours that you could be able to go on um, but you are going into the summer and campuses look a little bit different during the summer than when you're there during the school year the flowers are in full bloom you're going to be in college when there's snow on the ground but it's a great way for you to get the idea of the location, idea of the size, an idea if it is part of your fit pyramid or not. So continuing your research and preparing for your visits, developing your questions, dressing appropriately. If the weather says it's gonna rain, you wanna make sure that you're bringing an umbrella or a raincoat, checking your background and your experiences, okay. I want to make sure that my social media put a good presence out there for me. I want to make sure I understand where I'm going. You do your map quest and your Google search and add another 10 minutes onto your additional trip just in case you hit traffic or a bus route in the morning. You want to make sure that you're arriving on that campus with enough time to catch your breath, relax before you present yourself to the admissions offices. And usually what's going to happen is when you walk into the admissions office, the first person you're going to see is going to take note. Did this student come in and introduce themselves properly? Or did the student's parents introduce themselves first? Okay, you want to make sure that you have that discussion in the car with your family of how am I going to put myself out there? And how am I going to put the best positive opportunities for me and my family going onto that college campus? Um, we want to think about ways to visit a little bit differently now, virtual tours. It's a great opportunity for you to understand that school a little bit better, especially if it's a distance away or right now we're still under COVID restrictions. But those virtual tours are really designed for the college to show you what they'd like you to see. But admissions counselors do take note, especially if you're a top lead, that that note is, oh, the student was on a virtual tour for that day. And then with the virtual tours, many times you have an opportunity to touch base with admissions counselors. Virtual open houses are a great way to experience that campus as well. Many um, classrooms may be open to you. You might learn more about the majors, more about the clubs, the activities, the sports that you're interested in. And then, like I said, as we're starting to transition out, you're going to have that chance to finally get onto those campuses and see what it's like. And especially most likely in the fall, the college will be really ramping up those in-person experiences. What are you looking for in your college? Again, understanding that fit pyramid, that sense of comfort. When you're walking around, yes, you should 
Make sure that you're introducing yourself properly when you walk into the admissions office, introducing yourself to um, the administrative assistant, to the tour guide, and then introducing your family members that are with you. But keep in mind that tour guide may have a clipboard with them, and on the other side of the clipboard is going to be the tour script. And it's going to show the tour guide exactly where they should go on campus to see the best classrooms and the best campus experience for you. It's all scripted, but it's your job to be smart consumers. Take it in, get to the front of the line, have your list of questions ready, and, and follow through on the tour. But afterwards, if you have the opportunity and restrictions uh, allow you to, take a walk around on your own. See that campus for yourself. If you have a chance to go into the dining hall and try the food or poke your head into a classroom in the fall, definitely take that experience. If you think about it, the college process, right? Many of the schools you're looking at are 30, 40, $50,000 a year. That's like buying a brand new car each year for the next four years of your life. You wouldn't buy a brand new car without taking out for a test ride. So even if restrictions are not lifted in the fall, before you make your final decisions on which school you're going to, please make sure that you have all the opportunities to really understand, yes, this is gonna be a best fit. If you're an athlete like Anissa, spend time with the team, understand who the coach is, learn more about that coach. So you make sure that again, you're understanding the culture you're going into. If you're, you're looking for different clubs or organizations or that right cultural fit for the college, making sure that you take part in those opportunities. Colleges are putting themselves out there. They're sinking a lot of money right now into video experiences and into online experiences so you can get a feel for those campuses. And definitely take those resources in and do your homework over and over again. As you go on your campus tours, you may see a room like this. You're not necessarily going to see the room that looks like this. But what is the reality for you? What is the reality on that particular campus? So Anissa, I want to kick it to you because of your tour guide experience that you have. Do you mind sharing a little bit about what it's like to be a tour guide and what you're looking for to be able to engage students and families in discussions with you? Of course. So um, I'm an admissions ambassador at MCLA. So I give tours to prospective students who want to see the campus, want to know a little bit more about MCLA face to face. Um, I know that right now because of COVID, I'm doing virtual tours, which is not as exciting. You know, you're not in the moment, you're not in the spaces, but um, it's something. So I know that during the tours where they were in person, you know, I would give them stories about myself telling them what I've experienced about the, the dorm spaces or the buildings, um, the difference between them, how, you know, Berkshire Towers and, you know, who they call their different. One is lively and one is not lively. Um, just basically being open to answering questions. Like as a person, an admissions ambassador, you have to be open to, you know, listening to what everyone has to say. So um, when it comes to answering those questions, if they ask you a question personally, answer it to the best of your ability. Um, I know that whenever a student asks me a question, I try to be the utmost honest about it. And um, that's what you should get out of experience in these, you know, going to the schools. So just not being afraid to ask questions. I know like a lot of people are hesitant about asking particular questions about classes or class sizes or the professors, but no, don't be scared to ask any questions. If you have no question is a stupid question. I always tell that them at the beginning of the tour guide. Like if you ever have any questions, just ask right away and um, I'm sure it will be answered. Great, thank you, Anissa. Um, one last piece that we wanna to touch on before we go to the Q&A is understanding that as you're transitioning into the summer months, this is a perfect opportunity for you to take time and sit down with that folder sit down with your own personal stories and begin to get the information out on paper because this is where your college essay is going to allow you a little bit of time and freedom so you're not stressed in the fall a week before the essay is due and you want to get it complete and off, off to the colleges. You want to make sure you're putting the best quality product out there, especially now when SATs may not be available as an option. Maybe you had a little bit of hiccup with the online learning and the grades may be a little bit of a concern for you. Your essay is gonna tell us, the admissions counselor, that, per, that your own personal perspective of who you are, your goals, your aspirations for yourself, where you see yourself in the future. You're gonna see when you start to look at the, um, 
applications, what the essay questions are. And they're all gonna be very, very similar. And the theme based around most of them is tell us your story. And we wanna understand who you are. We want that personal experience. And over the summer where you have time to think, you have time to reflect, you have time to write several drafts, have lots of people look it through for you. It's a perfect time to write that essay instead of when you're stressed in the fall. Emory, you're an expert on the essay process. Do you mind sharing some of your tips? Well, I think the expert part is where my seniors slow down the process because it does take time and it does, um, you need this summer to really start the process. And I want to remind you all, the purpose of the essay, remember, is to help the admissions staff learn something new about you that's not on your resume it's not on your transcript so you really need to think about those characteristics that are unique to you um, your essay should show something new about you because just like josh just said some schools if they continue to do sat test optional the essay and the teacher letter of recommendations have increased in their importance um, in each of these committees so try really hard not to repeat any content that's already been shared in the other pieces of your um, application. Your English teacher, super important people to you. If you have a relationship with the one from last year or this year, um, you definitely want to make sure that the right people are editing it for you. But in the end, that it's your essay, your word, words, your perspective. Because if you have too many people edit it, it ends up not being your essay, okay? So remember and be very picky on who is, and don't forget your school counselor. Um, we like to read through it also because it we can give a different perspective maybe than the English teacher, okay? So start them in the summer, try and get a couple rough drafts, and then come back with that uh, in September. Excellent. So for the three of you, I'm gonna go to the Q&A now. And then after the Q&A, we'll, we'll do our wrap up with our time, final review of our timeline and our tips. So one of the questions that has been an ongoing theme throughout the evening is in regards to AP classes. And um, what if a student does not receive a good, receives a good grade in the AP class, but doesn't do well on the AP exam? Maybe they have a one or two on the exam. And how will colleges review that? Emory, do you want to start first in regards to how you counsel students for AP exams? Sure. Um, it's hard to answer just in one or two lines because it's always about the story of the student. Okay. So how many APs they've had, what is their future major, what schools are they looking at? So it's not a quick answer, but I will say that one thing that I did just read um, is right now in the admissions process, when you apply, you're not putting down your scores. You're just putting down that you took the AP, uh, uh, excuse me, the AP class, okay? When you have your score, it's when you have your chosen college or university and you wanna transfer in that class, that AP, if you have a certain score for it. That's how it's been. Um, recently, one of the changes that we're seeing is some colleges, because they may not be looking at SATs any longer, are changing their application and actually asking for the AP exam score up front. Um, so that may change your answer. Um, so I think one thing, that's my school counselor perspective, but Josh, I actually was gonna reverse it towards you. Yes. Uh, what does it look like when a student, you see they've taken the classes, but we didn't send you the, the test scores. What are you thinking when you don't see test scores? Are you assuming that they're not strong or it was just the student's choice? So it can be one of two things. Number one is we are going to evaluate the student's transcript before we receive the test score. So most of the test scores actually come in um, in June and July of the senior, of, at the end of the senior year. So students already been accepted. They've most likely already attended orientation and then we received the test scores. We do wanna see that the students challenge themselves as long as they've had a discussion with their guidance counselor and their teachers to say, yes, go for, go for the AP exam We've, or go for the AP class, we fully support it because we will give that student a bump in the grade regardless of what they get on the AP exam. Now, once those AP exam scores come in, then what we do is we provide that to the academic counselors or some schools do the transfer counselors and they, re, they award the equivalency of credit for that particular class. So um, that is usually done by the time the student arrives 
on that campus in the fall. So you're sending the AP scores to the institutions you're gonna be attending in the fall. So at the time of the decision, most of the time, unless you've done an AP class earlier on in the year, we're not gonna see exactly what those AP scores are. We're just gonna be able to reward you for the grades and the opportunities that you decided to challenge yourself above and beyond. Yvonne, you had several AP classes. How did you, what were your thoughts as you were taking them and going through that process and how you were leveraging them for your college um, admissions? I just took whatever APs fit in my schedule. I enjoyed the challenge. And for me, some of them didn't necessarily fit with my major, but they were fun. And the big thing is trying to get the college credit is extremely helpful. I was very successful in my APs and my dual enrollment. So when I did enter college, I entered as a sophomore standing. So that saved me an entire year of college. So with that year, I could choose to do a double major. Um, I could choose to go light on my course load while I was adjusting. I think my first semester, I took about 14 credits because I didn't want to overload myself while I was still getting used to the changes. So just the fun of an AP, if you like a good challenge, is really great, even if it's unrelated to whatever you're studying. They're good to get your mind moving, and they do show you more the pace of a college class. You're on a similar timeline to college classes. It's a little bit longer, but it moves so quickly, and that's a really great starting point to help you understand what to expect in the future. Excellent. Thank you so much. We have another question in regards to the effects of COVID. So right now, many students cannot participate in clubs, organizations, or sports, or, or even throughout the course of this year because of the pandemic. So how do you reflect that upon your college application? And one of the best ways that we strongly encourage that is just addressing it in your college essay. So when you're writing your story, telling us what you're passionate about, what you've been involved with, with clubs and organizations before, or part-time jobs or opportunities or other highlights about your life that were pre-COVID or that you do plan on doing during your senior year, hopefully. Um, but that's the perfect uh, median for you to be able to explain that. Colleges certainly understand that we know that there's been so many restrictions and so many opportunities that have gone awry because of, of COVID. So when you have a chance to sit down with your top five schools to write those essays for those top schools, just address it in there that said, you know, as a result during my sophomore year, my junior year, I wasn't able to participate in these, but I do have some passion and interest in exploring more in these particular clubs or organizations in college. Um, many students may not be interested in organized clubs or organized sports in high school, but you have other passions and really allowing those passions to come out with your essay. The essay is going to be such a critical piece and when evaluating college applications over the next year to two years because of this deficiency we've had because of COVID. Gosh, can I just jump in real quick, just to add two more points, sure. uh, is on that common application that I was talking about, there is a new added question, um, you know, how has COVID affected you or whatever. This is, that's another great spot for the student to add maybe the activities that they were not able to continue uh, in that section, but also be uh, stay in contact with your school counselor. We're constantly being still offered virtual opportunities. So if right now you are looking for something new, um, as an experience, contact your school counselor and let them know. Because a lot of times when I know, I write notes down, I have stickies all over my office. And so when something new comes across my desk, I then can think of a, you know, that student that would be perfect for that. So make sure you let your counselor know you're looking for um, any virtual opportunities right now while maybe some of your regular clubs and activities are not continuing this year. Excellent. And Amory, I'm going to come back to you with the next question here is, as a sophomore, is there a specific timeline that they should be considering um, when to contact admissions offices, when to start working with their guidance counselors, or should they just wait till junior year? Great question. What I think you should do is if you're already past the registration of your courses for next year, um, because right now is usually a very busy time for your school counselor, I would schedule an appointment some point this spring, let them know that you're interested in already beginning 
the the um, you know beginning steps of the college search process. You're right. Uh, most of our energies right now are heading towards our juniors and wrapping up our seniors. But if I know I have a freshman or sophomore that would like to start the process earlier, process earlier, I will meet with them and I will give them some beginning steps. And some of it might be um, more career interest inventories to be doing right now. So you could be thinking uh, more about um, things you can be doing right now to interest yourself in different majors. Maybe we'll have a conversation about your resume. Where have you spent your time? Um, and a lot of it is is uh, planning out your courses over the next couple of years. Uh, so it is important. You may not get as much as your, you know, the juniors are getting right now, but I, I love meeting with a sophomore now uh, so that I know because it's never too soon. And I think our two students were saying that here. Um, and there's definitely things you can be doing on the College Board website already. So contact your school counselor and make an appointment. And Anissa, this next question I'm going to start with and I'm going to kick it to you because um, I really want to, your, your feedback on this from the student tour guide perspective. But um, how, do you, how do we identify top leads? How do admissions counselors identify top leads? And, and certainly top leads are the students who are, are not afraid to step outside their comfort zone, are willing to have that discussion with the family ahead of time have a list of questions ready to go, shows a sense of maturity. When you meet in person, have that smile. When we can do handshakes, potentially have a handshake, and just step outside that comfort zone a little bit to show you have an interest in the school. Doing research about that school is really important because it tells me that you care, that you're not just worried about you know, what is the size or where is the location, but you actually want to know a little bit more about the major. You've taken time out of your day to understand and study my school, to think about my institution as a strong possibility for you. So having a list of four or five questions, when you have an opportunity to go visit campus, that you step to the front of the line, um, your parents should be there, but behind you, and you start asking that, that uh, tour guide those questions. You ask to maybe meet with your admissions counselor after your tour, or you're the one that's emailing directly to the admissions counselor ahead of time, or even picking up the phone and having a, a great conversation. So students who are stepping outside their comfort zone just a little bit differentiates you from everybody else. And Anissa, what stands out for you when you're working with students and families on a college tour? What are those students that you come back to the admissions office and say, yes, I really like my tour with this particular student? Um, I can definitely say when the students are interested in trying new things. So. Like I, like I mentioned before, I talk about the tons of clubs that we have at MCLA. And when the students are interested in a particular club, like, oh, I've never done that before. Like, I'm very interested in knowing more about that. It interests me, like, I wanna talk more about it because it's important to step out of your comfort zone and to try new things, especially when you're going into a new environment, meeting new people. Um, this is a way that you step out of your comfort zone and find those friends that maybe end up being your best friends, you never know. Um, but I always go back to that admissions um, individuals and I always tell them like, I have someone that's interested in this club or that's interested in step or is even interested in playing a sport, which is always my excitement when someone wants to play a sport. I'm always like, of course, like this is what you can do. It's just giving them that information of, oh, I'm, I wanna try to do this or I'm thinking about doing this. No, you can absolutely do it. And um, so that's something that interests me a lot that I go back and talk about. So Emery, let's go to you for the ACT question and then we'll wrap it up um, with this question that's specifically directed to Yvonne and Anissa. Sure, so the question is, uh, is the ACT as important or useful as the SAT. So basically the SATs are more popular where we live, okay? So if you were in California right now, all the students would be thinking of taking the ACT for the first time. So basically it's not one is better than the other. Um, what I usually advise is that most of our students will take the SATs twice if they don't like their scores or they're not comfortable, then I advise my student to also take the ACT because there's a different format to that test. And to be honest, I do find my students um, tend to do a little bit better on the ACT. So it's really what your school is offering, directing you to do, um, but it's not that one is better than the other. 
if you send both to an institution, they have kind of like this scale that they use and they will go with the higher. They're scored very different, um, but they'll go with the higher of the scores. So you cannot hurt yourself if you only do SATs and you cannot hurt yourself if you only do ACTs. Um, a combination of the two is usually recommended when a student feels that they may struggle with their test taking um, you know, abilities. Um, so that's usually when a student will take both. Excellent. And then to Yvonne and Anissa, Yvonne, would you mind starting with this question? Is um, looking back at your college process, what questions do you wish you had asked college admissions counselors or what do you wish you had known um, before you chose the institution you did? I personally wish that I had talked to more students. I had lots of information from counselors about the program, the culture, the clubs, things like that. But after arriving at college, my biggest struggle was the adjustment period. The first month of college was very difficult for me. I was unsure of my choice. I am a very social person, but for some reason I had a hard time making friends and taking the jump to get into these clubs. And I was very intimidated by the culture. I knew I liked the size of UMass, but I was just very intimidated. So I wish I had talked to students about what they did to make friends their first week at school or good ways to get involved in clubs and like easy ways to find clubs you're interested to, good places to go on campus just to sit and relax outside of your dorm. That student life and how students, especially students in your program, interpret the campus and the social scene is something that I think more students should look into getting information on because counselors will give you great information on most aspects of the school and what they perceive the social life as, but it's different for every student and it's a really, really hard change to make. So when you go in with an idea of, I wanna join this club and this club, and this is how I'm gonna find clubs, it's gonna be the best way for you to make that transition. Excellent. Thank you so much. That, that is critical information to share. Uh, Anissa, your thoughts? Um, I 100% agree with Yvonne. I can definitely say I wish I did a lot of things differently. One would be that I would go on way more college um, tours and visits than I did before. Um, the only school that I did visit was MCLA, and I ended up committing to MCLA. So um, it's important to get different, you know, different perspectives on different schools. So I would say visit as much schools as you want. Another thing is um, to look into those majors. I wish that I knew what I wanted to do early on so that I didn't have to waste time thinking about, oh my gosh, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? Um, and what do I want to major in, in in college? So I think um, that's something I'd do differently as well. And like Yvonne said, I would definitely talk to more people um, on the campus and ask them for their opinions and what they think and how you know, to join. I feel like it was a little bit easier for me since, you know, I was committing to MCLA and I was already going to preseason and already meeting people at preseason that I had, were friends with, but that not, that may not be the case for everyone else. So um, it's important to talk to people. So I'd say those are the things I'd probably do differently. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah. you your Yours and Yvonne's um, thoughts, opinions, suggestions, and advice are so critical to our presentation tonight. Um, Emory, let's wrap it up. Let's look at the review of our timeline, please. Okay, take off the mute. <laughs> um, so just a real quick. So right now we want you to be researching and visiting your schools. Again, the first step is to doing that self-reflective work um, to figure out what you should be looking for asking your teachers for letters of recommendation before you go for the summer, um, either taking an SAT at your school this spring if it's being offered or locally, and then signing up for your second one, which can be August or, uh, or October, uh, finishing your resume by August, getting your common application started along with some college essays this summer. So that sounds like a lot, but if you kind of work it out um, and stay organized and help those around you to keep you organized, um, it'll be a great process for you to return in September 
to have a couple uh, uh, essays done. Your teachers will be handing you their letters. You'll have started your college applications. You'll be right on time to come back in September for your senior year. Excellent. And then just some of our final tips for the evening. And then I'm going to turn it back to Yvonne, Anissa, and Anne-Marie for their, their final thoughts and words of advice and wisdom as we wrap up our time together this evening. But as we began this evening, students, tell people. Tell people what you're thinking about. Tell people that you want to be a business major, a bio major, that you're looking at a two-year school or a four-year school, because you will be absolutely amazed at the amount of support and the amount of opportunities that are going to become available for you just by sharing your thoughts. And then always kind of taking a step back and thinking about the college admissions process from the big business side of things, from the college side of things. You're not going to find any snow. You're not going to find any um, frowns. You're going to find bright, sunshiny, happy people with the coolest designs and the greatest graphics on the material that's coming in your houses, the emails, the phone calls that you're getting, the videos, and that's all designed for us to capture your attention. Again, remember, we want the best possible students at our institutions, and in order for us to do that, we need to go out and we need to find our top leads. And it's very easy to become a top lead by segmenting yourself out just a little bit, stepping outside that comfort zone, putting yourself forward with organization of questions, ideas, contacting the admissions counselors directly. And even right now, if you don't have a chance to experience one of these virtual college fairs or go to a campus event, you can easily go online, look at the admissions office, and every single admissions page has a listing of their staff and where they're responsible for um, as regards to application reading or territories they're responsible for, and drafting a nice introductory email about yourself. College admissions counselors are going to love that because now you're stepping outside your comfort zone, you're, you're stepping aside from all those other students that might be interested, and you're beginning to put yourself forward. So really thinking about uh, this piece from the student's perspective and then also thinking about it from uh, the admissions counseling perspective. And then the last piece is enjoy this time with your family as you're going through. Many places, once you have a chance to visit, they're like country clubs. They're really neat, small vacation opportunities. And just enjoy this time together because once college hits, it's gonna be intense, it's gonna be busy, it's gonna be very active. There's gonna be new academic opportunities, new places for internships and job opportunities. You may not have this time together in the future right away. So please spend that extra time together as a family and enjoy this process. The more that we do now, and the reason why tonight's program was so intense is because we want you to have this information up front. We do not want you to get hit and blindsided and be stressed out in the fall when all of a sudden your college applications come due. The more we can do now and the more that you can navigate the process now, the less stress you're gonna have in the fall. So Yvonne, I'm gonna to go to you and then Anissa and Anne-Marie to wrap it up. Yvonne, your final thoughts. I think I pretty much got everything out on the table. <laughs> um, if you guys can look at the Q&A to the answered questions, there's lots of other great advice that we didn't answer out loud that has been typed in. And overall, just be involved with it. Be involved with your family, with these counselors, with students, with staff at your high school. Talk to your friends about what they're looking at and what their interests are. And just make sure that you have it all laid out in front of you. Do a spreadsheet, get your interests down. And from there, once you have all of these ideas there in front of you, then you can kind of filter out what's your needs, what's your wants, what you are thinking. And it'll just be easier once you can just get all your information into one place. Thank you, Yvonne. Anissa. I would just say my final advice would be do what's best for you. You know yourself more than anyone else does. You know what you can handle. You know if you want big classes, small classes. Um, you know what you want for yourself. And if you don't, then it's, you have time to self-reflect. You have time to sit down and write that list about, this is what I want in college. And college is a huge accomplishment. Um, even being on this right now, listening to all of us and all of our stories, this is a step of being involved and actually wanting you know, to listen and understand what you can do to better yourself for the future. So I applaud everyone who's on here. And um, my final, you know, say of the night would be again to 
you're gonna do it, you're gonna be fine, um, but you have to put in the work. And if you don't put in the work, it's gonna be a little challenging. But if you do everything that we've said right now and more and get you know more informed, you, you're gonna be okay. I know it's stressful right now. It was stressful when I was in high school um, with everyone trying to tell me this and trying to tell me that. It's overwhelming. But like I said, at the end of the day, you know what's best for you and you guys are gonna do great. Thank you so much. Anne-Marie. Yes, so I wanna second everything everyone has already said, but go in a different direction. I wanna remind all the students on and the families to take care of yourself through this process. And it is a process and it takes a team to get to the end, okay? So the finale is May 1st of your senior year. That's when you have to provide a deposit to a school saying that you're coming, maybe save me a bed on campus because I'm gonna be living there but it's a process, it's an ever-changing process. And when you think you actually understand it, something's gonna come out of the blue. So think of your resources, your local admissions counselors at BCC, MCLA, Williams College, they help our families. You don't have to be applying there, but they help our families. Your school counselor, your teachers, um, really lean on each other because if you're a person that doesn't like to ask for help, this could get a, like a really challenging process have fun with it. Remember why you're doing this. This is a, like uh, Anissa was just saying, it's an ama amazing accomplishment to even have the opportunity to be looking at colleges. Um, and also a lot of my students are asking me about this last year, about COVID and the pandemic. And maybe we have some grades that are lower. Maybe we have some activities that had to stop. You need to remember that all admissions counselors across the United States lived it with you they understand. So your job now is to swing it back up. You have to get those grades up third and fourth. You have to come back strong quarter one and two of senior year, okay? Um, we just have to. And you have to show them your true ability because next year is the closest you'll ever be to a freshman in college. So yes, it was a hard year. And yes, you maybe became someone that you normally wasn't but you have to remind yourself all the hard work you've put in through all of your education and why you wanna to go to college because it's an amazing opportunity that you all deserve. And also my final note is sometimes we have to take other steps first before we end up where we wanna be. And that's okay if plan B or plan C is what you end up starting first out of high school, you just need to make sure you have a solid plan. And uh, I just also wanna commend you all for coming tonight. Thank you so much. Excellent, thank you, Anne-Marie. And that's an excellent way to wrap up. Congratulations to the students and to the families for being part of tonight and allowing us to share with you that inside perspective that we see in the admissions office, in the guidance office, and as students every single day. I'm very, very honored and very thankful and grateful to, to be with outstanding people like Anne-Marie, like Yvonne, like Anissa, and our friends at Adams Community Bank with Taylor and Chris. This is an outstanding resource for our community to allow us to be very, very successful as a whole and an opportunity for our students to continue to grow, continue to learn, and to take that next step with their education. So thank you very much for your time this evening. I'm going to bring it back to Taylor and Chris to wrap up the program. Absolutely, I would like to thank everybody who has stayed with us to the end. I hope you found this program valuable and we wish you the best on your college journey. We hope you enjoy each step along the way. Thank you all. Have a nice night. Yes, good night, everybody.